Welcome to Archaic Knowledge Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to uh, be with you guys both here. I'm excited about uh, what we can get into today. Well, we've had a nice conversation in the back room, so to speak. It's been great getting to know you. Yeah, yeah. We met uh, on the eclipse, October 14th, here in Texas. Nikiana Jones, the great rock hound, invited us <laughs> to come to her aunt's house. And you came all the way down from Austin to get together with people interested in unusual events, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. Had a blast down there uh, at Nikki's, and uh, it was fun watching that eclipse. It was really interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I was thinking it would be nice to start with a biography. You mentioned recently that you're Irish, so let's start with your Irish lineage. Yeah, my family goes back to Ireland. Um, we came over in the 1850s, around the time of the famine, on cattle barges and came in through Louisiana up into Texas. I actually had a chance to go over to Ireland. It was one of my first handful of trips when I started traveling. Loved the country. It was absolutely amazing. Went back to the, found the town that uh, my family come from, which is Castle Pollard. Was able to connect there with the uh, town historian, found records of my family and even uh, the house that they used to live in, which was really interesting. It's still standing, um, not owned by my family or anything like that, but in the names have changed a little bit over the years, right? But uh, that was all very interesting, a lot of fun to uh, to have that experience and then explore that country with such a, a rich history. Did you find a lot of crazy weather when you were there? We, yeah, I did. And I, I loved it, actually. Um, everything, <laughs> I, I don't know, it just really fit my my personality and mood, this dreary weather. I love it. Um, the, the the rain and, and clouds and stuff. And you get some sun. We got some great sun while we were out there, too. But everything's just so green. Mm. And, uh, and we got the rain for sure. Um, I just posted today my new Grange and Dolman videos. I, I moved it over to Rumble. It's on YouTube, but I just moved it over to Rumble today. So if people are um, interested, uh, that's up uh, of an old video, which, by the way, go gentle on me. Anybody that might be listening, if you watch that video, that was one of my first videos that I ever put out. So you've got me presenting to the camera like, hi, I'm mike and today on wandering well it's just very awkward <laughs> we were much more relaxed with our filming nowadays so uh go easy with me on the presentation but the video stuff is great i think for that one we we hit new grange and all the dolmens and stuff up there in every kind of weather so it was fun yeah i saw that video it's fantastic and new grange is astounding um you also uh, that same video you got a, a i think three dolman sites and I'd re i'm really interested in those can you do you have any slides you can show us on that yeah yeah absolutely i think this one here Paul lebron is probably the most iconic dolman in ireland it's up on a hill the entire area is covered with the, all these rocks and stuff so they used clearly the uh, what was around them here you know it's just so clear you know, that that's not a natural formation, right? A lot of the dolmens and different things that you get into, especially when you get into America, um, you know, all, always explained away as glacier, glacial erratics. But something like this is just so clearly, you know, just such a great example of a dolmen. Now, there's a theory out there that dolmens were built to protect the person inside the dolmen from cosmic rays so that they could have telepathic connection to ET or inner earth beings. Now, this is pretty out there for a lot of people, but that's one theory because we have to wonder what these are actually for. Academia calls them tombs or academia says they're hastily constructed structures for protection by primitives. And you're like, well, if they're primitives, how are they lifting these things? And if they're hastily constructed, how did they do it in such haste? Because <laughs> these are huge, right. huge, uh, huge uh, pieces of stone. How, how, you know, so none of what academia says makes sense. How could that be a tomb? A tomb is supposed to keep animals from this doesn't keep an animal out. Uh, so what do you think this is? I mean, I'm sure you have an opinion. I find it more likely that these were repurposed as, a, as most ancient sites have been. Um, over thousands of years. You know, a lot of dolmens do have remains in them. I probably like to think that that's more likely that they were repurposed at a later date for a burial site, perhaps. As to their original purpose, I would probably, with all due respect to anybody who has these theories, because I never want to negate on ideas um, and pursuing those ideas, I think there's value in 
and pursuing all ideas and, and, and questions, but I, I would have to probably negate any, any type of um, theory, at least in terms of my, my personal opinion around these being used for protection or anything like that. If you had the ability to lift stones on this level and this type of scale, you'd have a, the ability to create fortifications and different types of stuff to where you wouldn't even have to worry about that. I think if you're a culture that's advanced enough to do this, you're probably at the top of the food chain. I, I don't think that you're that you're at the lower end of the food chain anymore where you're worrying about predators in your area. I think you've mastered your surroundings at that point. I'm really focused on documenting all these to generate questions for hopefully smarter minds than, than, than mine to come in and, and present some theories. But I, I absolutely do have my own thoughts on quite a bit of stuff around the world. There's no way to like travel to all these sites and not create your own opinion. But the dolmens do kind of remain a mystery because you have a wide variety of, you know, shapes and, and types, some with three points, four points, some with very large. Now, Ireland, and I'll just go ahead and move forward here in the clip yeah. to show you a great example of the differences of dolmens. So if you're looking at this one right here, it's very square and very erect, balanced. But when you move on from this, and I'll, I'll, I'll slowly scroll through so people can see what's going on here. When you move on from here to our next dolmen, which is Browns Hill Dolmen, you'll see it's very different. Now, this dolmen I love to use in reference to the Balanced Rock Dolmen in, uh, up on the East Coast in New England. It's almost exactly similar from the balancing points down there at the bottom. Now, this one has collapsed, but you can easily recreate that in your head in terms of what this would have looked like when it was stacked together. But it has a very different feel than the other one. But a lot of that may be due to the type of stone that they were using. You're up in the hills there in Ireland for Polna Braun, and here at the Browns Hill Dome, and you're kind of out in some rolling, rolling hills and plains and farmland. The other area is very rocky, hilly. You're going up, up and over hills and cutting through rock formation, whereas here you're, you're in flat land and farmland. So there is a different type of stone being used at those two sites. It's interesting that they are using crystalline material to create a space that's big enough for a person. Many dolmens are just big enough for one person. Some you could fit a few people into maybe, but so a person gets in there, presumably that's the reason that, that they set these up and they have this really thick roof of crystal material that's doing something for them. Academia says it's a shelter. It's like, well, for one person. I think we can logically cross off the shelter argument. It doesn't make sense. For the type of person living in any area that might be worried about or existing in a time period where you're worried about either attacks from other people or animals, this seems very impractical. And if it's for rain, you, you've got one person protected from rain, kind of, unless the rain's going horizontal, which it does in Ireland, and then the rest of the tribe is wet. Well, and, you know, you can build a much better structure out of smaller stones, which we see examples of in Skellig Michael with the beehive uh, constructions and different stuff. If you want to build something out of stone, there's much easier ways to do it than lifting megalithic blocks and stones that weigh dozens of tons. I, I, you know, some of these are just massive as you can sell. I'm standing next to that dolmen right there. I'm six foot three, you know, 240 pounds, 230 pounds. These are massive. It, it makes me look tiny. Could this be an example of ancient human ingenuity, of ancient human engineering? Could humans lift those stones up without a crane using wooden levers or stuff like that? Do you think this would be possible or how do you uh, envision this? One of my favorite theories that I've seen presented, and I, I, I don't know where this originates from, but I, it's, I remember it sticking with me from a comment in one of my videos someone left was that if you found stones in a certain placement or maybe the largest one and you built up earth around it, you could move balanced stones underneath it and then dig away all the dirt. But again, that would mean there used to be a massive hill right there for the largest rock to have been resting on for them to build underneath piece by piece and then remove the, the earth. I don't know, you know, could people manage maybe the ones I'm standing next to? Yeah, but when you start looking at the that bigger one, and then the placing on these dolmens, the placing them on top of the other stones and the balancing there, you do start getting into some more advanced um, modes of thinking in terms of how, how to make that happen. Probably one of the biggest disservices to our thought processes when it comes to trying to understand 
things like this, whether it's dolmens, the pyramids, or whatever it is, these great questions of how how did they do it, is by assuming that human progression has been on this linear scale of advancement. I don't think that we have been on this linear path of advancement as a people, as a human race. I think that, that we've had possibly several, but at least one up and down where we've been advanced in the past, advanced enough to, to clearly to do incredible works that have lasted thousands of years that we don't produce or do anymore. In Peru, we have uh, the three levels of engineering and the, the, the bottom level is advanced, very advanced. The, the next level is less advanced. So more recent is less advanced. And the very recent one is even less advanced than that. So we have the evidence that advanced cultures in the distant past were extremely intelligent as regards dealing with crystalline material, whether you uh, subscribe to the theory that these were concrete blocks or natural stones that were manipulated in some way. In regards to what Mike said regarding the development of uh, different civilizations across the globe and the linear interpretation. So I personally don't think that cultures or civilizations across the world reach the same level of development. Out here in the West and pretty much all over the world, you can see the advancement and the development of our civilization. Whereas in many other places, people are living like 2000 years ago, there, there are still people living at hunter-gatherer level at this point in time. So there's always always a uh, discrepancy and there's always a chance for a more sophisticated advanced civilization to arise somewhere on earth, you know, and influence all the other civilizations, be it peacefully through teachings or through the power of the sword. And by the way, as far as manipulation goes, what do you guys think about the idea that in legend in, across the world, there's many legends that stones have been lifted by levitation, perhaps by sound frequency? Well, you have legends of, of sound doing an incredible thing in all sorts of different cultures. I mean, even in the Bible, you know, walls of Jericho being an example. They're doing amazing things with levitation right now with sound. There's videos going around uh, social media and on the internet right now of them using sound to fixate objects at a singular point and move it in precise movements with robotics and sound. It's a fact that you can levitate and do things with sound. They're doing work like that right now, but it's at a small level. Um, a very small level of these things that I keep seeing that are being created in labs or wherever. Yeah, so I mean, scale that up. It's possible. I couldn't tell you how to how to do that. We certainly don't have anything that I'm aware of that we're using for in terms of modern conveniences with sound, which I think is, uh, you know, the effects of sound or you know, what is, is it cymatics? That stuff starts getting really interesting to me to see the effects of sound on matter and uh, the way you can use it to shape things. Um, it, that, that's a very interesting, very interesting topic. It's an interesting question because it opens up a lot of different things that delve into different types of technology and advancements that, you know, I mean, obviously that sh shatters the narrative of what we understand in terms of history. Right. Um, if if something like that were be, to be established, that that's how things were done. When you get to these dolmens, I think it's, you know, you start getting into a lot of conversations around a lot of these ancient sites around the world. Some places are clearly cut, clearly, in my opinion. Other places do very much look like they were perhaps geopolymer or poured, you know, that they had an understanding of creating concrete type stones that are just much better than what we understand. So to the point that we're looking at it as natural at this point, there's a lot of different possibilities. But when you look at the dolmens here that we're that we're showing, the, these look like these were a rock. Most of them perhaps found and used in their natural shape and state to create these things, mostly all over the world. I don't see a level of uniformity that tells me that there's some specific style other than the placement of them on top of each other. If you could carve the, the rocks for these dolmens in such a way, why wouldn't you make them more unique or uniform or square? Yeah. For, for example, this, why would you, why wouldn't you square it off in, in, a, in a way? And I will say this, you know, when you start getting into the unanswered questions and the mystery of it, I mean, that's the exciting part of all of this. And this is definitely what's inspired me to go around and document in as many places as I've been able 
and hopefully continue to be able to do. Right. And you've been to so many sites. I mean, it's astounding. I mean, it's just, <laughs> the amount of work you've done just to get to the sites and then you make these great videos. It's it's really fantastic for us because we're trying to get out of the five control you. matrix and you're helping us get out. So that's that's really great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. The, and, and getting to some of these places is part of the fun, right? You know, I always like to say when I started doing this, I knew that I knew I couldn't get the best film. I, I wasn't good enough yet. I, I had no experience. You know, there's a lot of things that I knew that I couldn't do. But what I could do was get to some of these places. I knew that I could I had it in me to get to some of these places that people hadn't been yet because yeah. um, it's either hard to get to or it's dangerous. And these these were things that I just didn't mind. Uh putting since you know these scenarios that I didn't mind putting myself into it was exciting and fun and that's slowly developed into hopefully some good film work uh, that people are starting to appreciate I think so you know I've gotten better at the filming and drone work and stuff uh just by continuing to hammer away at getting to these places and just do it You've done some research on Coral Castle. We were talking about the sound frequency connection. So the idea is that Ed Leedskalnin built uh, Coral Castle single-handedly and that some children saw him working. He was very private about his building, so he didn't want anyone to watch him. But these yeah. children at night saw him working. They climbed the wall and looked down and watched him. And they said he had upside down ice cream cones in his hands that were stones. Their narrow part was at the top. So he was using these cones, pointing the cones at the stones. So two little crystalline stones in his hands were what he was using to levitate these massive coral blocks is what these kids said who watched him. So we have that testimonial evidence that someone figured out how to use energetic levitation to work with massive blocks because how is this 100 pound guy by himself moving these massive blocks? I mean, when when even the cranes that we have, the best cranes that we have couldn't move the, the biggest blocks that he moved. I don't know. They can barely move the smaller blocks that he moved. So so at least we have that in the modern times. And then we have legends from Tibet, the monks using these long trumpet-like instruments that were supposedly able to lift these massive blocks hundreds of feet up. And so we have the stories, the testimonials. So Roz, what were you going to mention? Looking at the dolmens, I find them pretty similar to the balancing megalithic rocks that are scattered all over the world. There are some examples in Finland of for parts uh, different parts of the world with where there are you know megalithic blocks just standing on smaller smaller blocks and those i don't know they weigh so much i don't see 100 men lifting them up so my question for mike is do you find they're somehow related the dolmens with the uh balancing megalithic stones yeah i guess i'd have to maybe look at a specific place that you're talking about I think anytime you start getting into these megalithic stones and these blocks and structures, you know, we're talking about work on a scale that is not compatible with what we're being told about history. The problem is the dates. The dates don't work. The possibility that this is so ancient that it's been weathered down into like this unkind of recognizable feature. Well, there's plenty of examples of sites around the world where you have that going on. And it's not argued because it's supported either in its positioning around other stuff that isn't weathered. But when you find something like this all by itself, it does make you think. And I do think that these are the type of things that are worth exploring, right? Stuff like this. So the timelines are all wrong. Are clearly the ability of, of ancient peoples to do incredible works is far beyond what the kind of narrative of progression of advancement supports that's why i referenced the balancing rocks because i felt they're different than the actual dolmens that to me look like you know landmarks with a specific purpose i don't know exactly what is but i feel like the ancients wanted to leave their legacy and signal signal us something you know show us something through those dolmens there is some written evidence pretty debated about people of bigger stature from the past as i'm looking at formations that are, are out of place here in romania i usually found stuff also on top of mountains there there are mountains where that are just you know plain they're just like plains. There, there are no rocks, but on top of the peaks, there are some stone formations, usually 
they're not in place you know they're they're pretty much wrecked destroyed but for me it raises questions how did those uh, you know rock formations pop up on top of mountain peaks where there there aren't any you know stones on a mild radius i feel like at this point mainstream archaeology has so discredited itself uh, with the shutting down of ideas and different things that have been proven wrong about stuff um, that everything should be questioned everything um, that we find that looks interesting and has been explained away as a natural formation should be reconsidered and explored there is no lose so when people come against a rail against this as if they if, as if the question's already been answered um, I disagree and you know continue to ask the question so could we be wrong? Could Jimmy be wrong about the Rishot structure? Can we be wrong about the safe wall? Absolutely. But by investigating it and researching these things, you're you're ultimately contributing. The end, the end result is going to contribute one way or another. We're going to under, have a greater understanding and knowledge and awareness of these natural processes and formations that would create these incredible structures, and thereby contributing to modern geology, archaeology, or whatever it is or we're gonna make some incredibly new discovery. And I, I don't look at it as a failure. If we find one thing, if you're, if you're out there researching and you're looking into this stuff and you find something that can completely disproves your theory, well, you've done the work and that can be contributed to the natural side of it as well. We're learning and growing together across the board. There's always gonna be people that see something and think it's a thing one way or the other. There's right. no way around that. But if you're doing the work, it's going to end up somewhere contributing to something. So there, in my opinion, there is no lose by, by asking these questions. So when you see something out there that's incredibly unique, and I, this is something that I always want to encourage people, anybody that I interact with, if you're, I can't tell you how many people reach out to me and send me emails or direct messages and stuff, you know, wanting to share pictures with me, telling me that they're, they're avid hikers and explorers and they've been going out for 20 years up in New England or up in the West Coast or wherever it is and exploring and they've taken all these pictures. You, any of us can do that and we should mm -hmm. and, and and contribute to the conversation. Maybe it gets explained away uh, and maybe it is a natural formation. Cool. Well, we've just documented something new and uh, something interesting. And if research done, is done on it, perhaps we gain more information that contributes to our understanding of natural formations and the way the world works. And if it's not natural and we're able to discover that, we are contributing to what we're all trying to do, which is gain, gain a greater understanding of our, our history and our past that feels like it's been hidden from us. Well, clearly something's going on in the distant past on Terra that uh, is outside the academic box. So if I were a student, a young person, uh, 18, 20, 22, and I wanted to pursue archaeology. I'm I'm not sure if going into the university uh, is the best the best plan because you're going to get ideas. You're going to get shut down. They're, they're inside a box that is quite narrow. So uh, it's it's not that every everything in the university uh, education is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. There's a lot of great things that we've already got got to. We've we've got to a certain point of knowledge, and that's great. But we need to allow ourselves to be outside that academic box. So I think what you just said is so important. The last three or four minutes of what you just said is the key to, to everything that is important in the pursuit of this incredible mystery that is our planet, you know? Yeah, let me just say this too, um, for, for any of your listeners and, and viewers, um, I, I, you know, the main thing that I want to do with my work is, 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 um, document present and encourage i want to encourage people to do their own work find their own passions and let me just be very very clear when i say this you don't need permission to go do anything around any of this whether it's filming taking pictures exploring going to your own site visiting yourself establishing your own opinion you don't need permission from anyone and your opinion and what you think is valid, explore it together, become a part of a community, get plugged in with people that, sh that are like-minded in terms of exploring the truth and looking for answers. Um, 
and 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 you know the argument so often is is that your opinion isn't valid because you aren't you didn't go to school or you aren't educated in this or that don't be afraid of being wrong somebody may say yeah that's easily explained as this type of geological thing cool you just learned something new apply that to the next time you go out well let's, um, this, this, whatever this, it is that's so that's so key and and let's zoom through the the dolmens in ireland and then get to uh this if you have the slides let's get to puma punku and tiwanaku sure sure uh, i don't know if this is showing right now but this yeah. is just a quick comparison of yep. dolmens uh obviously we just saw this, this is the brown tail dolmen in ireland yeah. this dolmen here is in korea and this is balanced rock up in new england right 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 so on three different continents and three different parts of the world, we've got these very, very similar dolmens here to, to look at in terms of size, placement, right. and everything. It's um, astounding how thick the, the roof is on some of these dolmens. Right? Yeah. And these are, these are always fun to go visit and look at. Um, you know, I feel like uh, dolmens kind of, or criminally overlooked a lot of times in favor of places like Baalbek or Egypt, which we all love to focus on, but there's a ton of really good little things like this in terms of uh, ancient history and stuff that's worth exploring. Right. Um, it, that, that are definitely worth your time to get into and learn about, but these are found on every continent in the world. As far as I know, um, I think that's correct. You can find dolmens on just about every con uh, continent on the world. Right. There's a, they're in high concentrations in all sorts of areas. And I think once these start being proven or accepted as for what they are in America, you know, that's a great way to start opening up that conversation and changing the narrative about prehistory here in the Americas. Shout out real quick to Julie Ryder, um, because she she did she has done so much work uh, and documenting uh ancient sites in uh, in Montana with her husband Bill Ryder. That's Julie at Sagewall. And you've done a lot of work at Sage Wall, and you just did an amazing interview with Jimmy Corsetti just yesterday, which I watched, and uh, it was absolutely phenomenal, the amount of work you've done at, at this wall. So uh, I just want to do a shout out to Julie, because she invited me up, uh, I spent three days with her and Bill and, and checked out the site and went to, you know, Starfire Duolith and other places. And I know that you've spent a lot of time up there doing your own research, which is so impressive, Mike. <laughs> I'm so impressed with what you've done, and you've got 340,000 views on your drone footage of Sage Wall. I mean, it just blew up like crazy. Yeah, one of those videos really took off. Um, I can't remember why. Well, Jimmy, when, once it was already doing really well, but once Jimmy did, we did a collab video for his channel that really just shot it off. And then uh, yeah. I think Joe Rogan tweeted it out. <laughs> and that, that just anything Joe Rogan touches is going to go viral. So. Right. Uh, and what a pleasure to bring attention to the uh, to the site up there, um, and uh, and uh, those those different areas. Montana is a very interesting space uh, to explore, and now that it's gaining more awareness, it's such a pleasure to hear about all the people that are going up there and visiting it, and all these other YouTubers and different people that are going up and documenting it. I absolutely applaud anybody and everybody who's up there doing the work, right. showing this place to people. And, um, you know, inviting more conversations. I think we need more ideas and, and thoughts and everything around it, uh, which is great. And um, I absolutely want to uh, uh, shout out to uh, Chris and Linda, the property owners up there at Sage Wall, because they're just wonderful people and um, uh, opening up their property. They didn't have to do that to allow people to come up there and view that wall. It's just, uh, you know, hats off to them. It's awesome. Most of the sites in Montana under the umbrella of Montana Megalis are on public land and, and but your friends there, uh, they have their, they opened up their own land to people to come to, to see stuff. Yeah, right. How awesome is that? Yeah, they discovered the wall, um, I think over 20 years ago and have slowly but surely been clearing that area away right. and doing the work, creating trails out there on their property so people could walk up there and see it and yeah. uh, just doing that work around there to make it, um, a place where people can come and visit. I do want to preface, you can go visit it, but you do have to make an appointment. So if you, if, if there's interest in going up and seeing the Sage Wall, don't just show up. You can't just show up there like it's a, right. uh, 
public land or something where you can go hiking or something, you have to schedule an appointment through their website, which is sagemountaincenter.org. I think it also behooves us to remember that every researcher that's delving into the ancient past has legitimate views of their own that they have reasons for having and that we should always, as you've been saying, keep our minds open to the questions that every single researcher is posing. If we if we think that we have the only answer, I think this, this could be a, another box next to the academic box that we need to then get out of again. Let's keep our minds open right. and answer, asking questions. And I wanna ask you a real quick question. You've done research at Sage Wall that leads you to believe that these blocks might be geopolymer. And as we go toward other sites in this in this uh, talk that we're having today, Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, Baalbek, I wanna, I want people to keep their minds open to the possibility that these might be geopolymer creations uh, academia tells us that uh, Egyptologists, for instance, tell us that the the Egyptians came up with copper chisels, but didn't know how to make concrete blocks. Why, why, right, right. why would a primitive people come up with copper chisels before they figured out how to mix concrete? It makes no sense whatsoever. So let's. I think we should people in general, when they're looking at ancient sites, should keep their minds open to the possibility, at least, that that these might be concrete and not natural stones that were worked. Yeah, you know, I um, I don't know if if they're geopolymer. I don't know. Um, you know, I like to put everything on the table and, and explore those ideas. Um, but Sage Wall is very interesting. You know, when I walked up on Sage Wall, it kind of first the 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 most comparable reaction that I could give. Um, to my experience of the first time I walked up on Sage Wall was walking up on Saxe Woman in Peru. It felt very similar in terms of size and structure. Now the the joints aren't fitted as well. I think if we have a man-made wall here at Sage Wall, it's incredibly old and has been incredibly weathered down and eroded. Um, so I think you 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 know going from the premise that it's a man-made wall, right? I think you also have quite a bit of natural weathering, erosion, and and effects on the on the wall as well. So you kind of have to look at like there's both things going on here because you do have cracks going down the length of the wall, but from top to bottom that make no sense in terms of structure, and those look like cracks. You can see that they're cracked through points that were solid pieces, right, almost right. rectangle type stones, as is um, seems to be the pattern there on that wall. So, um, you know, it's a it's a, a wonderful mystery, and the more that we're digging into it, the more it's like, uh, what a fun fun process. Uh, you know, been working with Chris there at the site for a couple of years. You know the the wall is highly magnetic. Um, so you can throw a magnet on it and it just sticks to the wall. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a, a geologist look at it. We've had a geophysicist look at it and do the ground penetrating rock wall and stuff. And so we're getting all those results back lately, which has been very exciting. Um, we know that there's some kind of reflector underneath 15 to 20 feet down that we're getting imaging back from um, that would, um, you know, now, there are multiple theories. It could be a water table, which we were told is highly unlikely, but still a possibility um, at that depth, um, bedrock or, or some type of foundation. But right. as you know, this is part of the process, continuing to gather that information so that we can have more to, to look at. For me, what is very intriguing about Sage Wall is clearly the wall, but the surrounding evidence in terms of the cup hole marks all over the place. There's areas that I found that are comparable to um, uh, Egypt. And in fact, I can show you a picture real quick of one of the comparison photos yeah. from Sage Wall. That'd be great. And the um, um, picture and a picture that I took with uh, in Egypt. So I've got that up here and I'll share that with you guys here on the screen. On the left is Sage Wall, and there on the right is from Karnak in Egypt. Now, 
I don't know if I'd even, I mean, uh, this would have stood out to me as unique anyways, but I had just been in Egypt about six months prior. And so this really stuck out to me because what you have here, can you see my mouse or is it just the picture on the yeah, screen? I can, we can see your cursor. Yeah. Okay. So this is a square cutout. Now this is really hard to tell just from the picture. You can see the shapes here, but that's why I want to make sure I'm showing you here. There's a square cut out here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just like this. Yeah. You have a channel running through here. Right. Um, and and that groove, that channel, is very clear in person. Okay. This is a circle, just like some of the other circles and cup holes that I've found in the area. And it's the rock breaks off right here. Okay. So that's why you're not seeing the completed circle, but this actually dips down right here. This is broken. All this is broken and then drops off. Okay. But you can see how clearly the shape is um, and compare, you know, how comparable it is here to the picture that I took in Karnak. And this yeah, is it's pretty similar. This is near the Sage Wall. It's not right, right next to it. Right next to it. Right next wow. to it. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. And, um, if I go, so first of all, you can see the straightness there. Hmm. But as you get into, and just look at that, that's a six foot tall person down there. Right. And there's a, from above, it just becomes even more impressive. And so we've got that example there that I showed before. And here's a, a great example of some of the cup holes that you can find in the area. You have some carved out um, spots within the, the stones all over the place, just like this. Little nubs and stuff around the area also as well. Um, there's a better shot of the cup holes, some more there. And uh, the wall is just so impressive, obviously. There's one. And this, as we come up, you'll see is right in front of the wall. So, I mean, this, this stuff, it's just right there next to the, to the wall that where, you're, where I was finding all of this stuff. So if you go visit, make sure up here at the top of the wall, check something like that out right there. Um, it's a lot of fun to explore, you know, and a lot of these things you just have to be very aware of what kind of what you're looking for, because most of the all of this stuff was full of debris. You know, that whole area, um, you know, you have a lot of debris, you know, their seasons can be pretty tough, you know, so it's, you know, there's a lot of debris every year that, you know, Chris has to go up there and clear for right. them to keep the site maintained. Um, so it's quite a bit of work. Well, when I was in Serbia, because um, I, after I spent time in Bosnia, I traveled to Serbia, Croatia, different places, and there was a bunch of uh, tunnels that were ancient tunnels that some friends in, in Serbia showed me. And uh, it turns out that the Romans found thousands of tunnels they recorded the tunnels but now they're all grown up with foliage and the only the, there's only a few tunnels left that anyone knows the entrances to and they only they know their locations to only a few of the ones that the romans documented and the romans didn't build any of those tunnels they just found them in serbia right. and so yeah. so the foliage covers them up and then we we're just we're just doing our thing we're on our cell phones and walking past ancient sites all the time we don't even know what's going on on our own planet uh and so this is this is key that you're doing this and uh it's key that your friends uh, uh have cleared the site around sage wall it's fantastic uh so that people can come in and 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 marvel at what what went on and yes the mystery draws us because uh it is so it's it is so bizarre to live on a planet that we think we're the first advanced race and we think we're the first the first ones to do anything interesting. No, the, the ancients did some stuff that's way beyond what we can do. I mean, it's astounding. Yeah, the 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 danger is is thinking that we're the most that we're the smartest that we've ever been. 
you know, um, that well, we're the smartest that are that as 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 humans that we that we've ever been in history. So uh, but that's the that's the thought process when you follow this yeah. scale of progression that's taught that you know from primitive to to now that creates this mindset of that we are advanced and um everything from our technology to our understanding of things which um i think is you know clearly not the case right well nasa yeah. has you know nasa has on their website that that the only place that we have found life in the universe is on earth even bacterial life and they say, but we're looking. And it's like, you're looking because every time the UFO comes into the frame, you turn your cameras off. So I don't think you're looking. Um, so uh, we we live in a universe teeming with, with life as far as the evidence goes. Um, we, we're in the academic box tells us that because the academia depends on NASA for their space info. So it's like academia says, we're the first advanced race. Everything you see must be natural or built by primitives. Really? Primitives built pyramids? Primitives. Right, so this, right. this is absurd. And we have to just jump out of that box and go, okay, now what? Well, we're going to ask some questions. We're all going to ask questions and we're going to do our best. We're all, we're all human. We, we're just human, but we're going to do our best by asking questions. And what you said about anyone being able to go out onto the land and, and make their own video and make their own decisions about what they think and put that up on the internet. Fantastic. That's what we need. We need more information, more information. So let's go to Tiwanaku. Let's go to Pumapunku and, and see what you think about uh, that. I would also like to add something uh, regarding the sage wall. And I would like to ask Mike regarding the age of it. Uh, how how old do you think, I mean, do you suspect this uh, uh, landmark is, Mike? Um, I, I, I think something like this would have to be ancient, ancient. So you know, um, I think we'd be working on a, a scale back to the, um, you know, working around these theories about 10, 11,000 years ago, stuff um, that, uh, you know, I think Graham Hancock's done a lot of work on establishing um, mm -hmm. as far as timelines. Um, but mm -hmm. this would predate, you know, the the level of weathering. If if this is a man-made wall, the leather, the, the, the level of weathering and erosion mm -hmm on it um clearly indicates it being incredibly old incredibly incredibly old right the and easiest you know, thing, to, the easiest we thing can to do is just look at something and ask yourself well is it megalithic this is and so that immediately puts it back thousands of years well, yeah. we have glacial activity in the last ice age that goes down in, Mont you know, because the, the glaciers came to a certain point in Montana, and it's just about where the Montana megaliths start. So you could say, well, maybe the glaciers didn't get that far down, because if they had, they would have taken down that whole site, and it would have been rubble, but they're not they're Everything's still standing. So what that means is that if the glaciers didn't get quite to where the Montana Megalith site is, if they stop just, just north of it, then that could be way more ancient than, than 12,000 years ago or 11,000 years ago. It could be 20,000, 50,000, who knows how, how many years ago it could have been created. Yeah. So, yeah. so if it's, so if it's really man-made and if there's been uh, some kind of, uh, you know, settlement there, some kind of uh, civilization, uh, how dig how how far should we dig to find evidence of such a such a culture? How how far do you think we should uh, we should as go? As far as as far and as deep as it takes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think with Sage Wall doing that ground penetrating radar gives us a goal um, for the future of excavating, hopefully eventually down to that 15, 20 foot mark and seeing what's down there. Because it'd be really interesting to see what's under 15 to 20 feet of that that earth down there at the bottom. Because if any anything is preserved underneath all of that, what a what a find, right? And some of this yeah. just you know a lot, you know, people want answers and they want them quick. Um, but that's not really how this works. Um the process of just getting to the point where we are at now with getting some of these results has taken several years. Um, and it would take 
you know, I think some of the, some of it can speed up as interest grows, but that's why I feel like it's so important to keep bringing, you know, stuff like this to the attention of people and to a, a wider audience. As support grows, interest grows, support grows um, a, a, around, you know, some of this takes money. Right. And right now, um, uh, you know, we're in a process where things are happening and that's great. And um, hopefully it's a snowball effect that just continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, For sure. But, the the but more yeah. people... The more people interested uh, in the Sage World, the more uh, you know uh, hypotheses uh, that come to uh, light, and uh, the broader the perspective uh, gets. So, um, in my view, so I, I pretty much like to entertain the idea that the wall being like before the uh, Ice Age, so uh, before the deluge, I pretty much enjoy entertaining the idea of uh, giants building it. And when I when I talk about this, I like to reference the uh, uh, Bible where there is uh, extent, extensive talk about uh, larger beings, uh, especially uh, during the uh, uh, exodus of the... Uh, of the Israeli people, and when they went to the, you know, uh, to conquer the promised land, uh, and also I think the most powerful references are from uh, uh, Numbers uh, passage, where it describes the battle of the Israelites against the uh, Philistines. So in Numbers, there, uh, Numbers thir thirteen, twenty-eight with nine. Uh, it's mentioned about the people who dwell in the land who are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And, you know, uh, it goes on saying that besides, so the scouts saw the descendants of Anak, uh, the Amalekites uh, that dwelled in the land of uh, Najib, uh, the Hittites, the, Je yeah, no, not this part, but I have something interested, interesting to uh, tell you about the um, the conquest of the promised land. Okay, but give me one moment to... Uh, okay, just so people to... know what we're looking at right here um, is this is Starfire Duolith, and there's there's many, many features up there near Sage Wall that uh, are obviously constructed Um and there, there are researchers who have also advanced the geopolymer theory for these structures. So, Mike, you're not alone in in suggesting that these could be that sage wall, for instance, could be geopolymer uh, blocks. Uh, that geopolymer being concrete. Um, and so, uh, I just wanted to let people know that this is called Starfire Duolith, and there's there's lots of uh, documentation of various sites like uh, features like this up in the Montana megaliths. So I'm just gonna exit the share screen and then we can get back to other other pictures that you guys want to put up. Yeah, so I don't know how how much you guys believe in the in the Bible reference, but it's pretty much the the best uh, ref, written reference that we have in regards to those beings. Uh, there's also you know the the book of Enoch uh, that's been uh, you know part of the the canon. It was like a holy scripture until the third century A.D when they uh, pretty much uh, removed it as just simple tales. And in, in there, it speaks of the uh, uh, the Nephilim and the, and the fallen angels. But it's pretty interesting because the uh, Old Testament, it's uh, built entirely uh, around this uh, nar narrative of the, you know, Yahweh um, getting rid of the, uh, you know, seed of the Nephilim. So uh, the giants that escape and they're, uh, extensive passages in the Bible, in the Bible, especially in the Numbers, uh, regarding the, uh, um, you know, the uh, Israelites fighting the Philistines. Uh, they mentioned so. Uh, besides Goliath, that was a um, um, nine feet and nine inches giant, uh, roughly three meters tall. There were also the, you know, the relatives of uh, Goliath, his cousins, brothers, and all that. And, and it's it's mentioned in the Bible. I don't know uh, how many people know about this, but in 2, Sa uh, in two Samuel uh, 21, 15 to 22, 
Uh, the passage recounts the slaying of four giants in uh, Philistine battles who were said to be descendants of the giants in Gath, uh, which was uh, Goliath's hometown and one of the uh, uh, largest Philistine uh, cities. So uh, it's mentioned about Sap or Sipai that was killed by uh, Sibakai. Uh, also a giant with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot that was killed by Jonathan, the son, the son of David's brother. Uh, the, the son, yeah, the son of David's brother, uh, a giant named Lagmi, the who was the the brother of Goliath that was uh, that had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod, so it was like a a, a twisted rod. Uh, this giant was killed by uh, Elahan, uh, and then another unnamed giant, also a descendant of the giants, killed by David's nephew uh, Jonathan. Uh, also in in uh, one chronicles is mentioned. Uh, Another um, so there's another account that mirrors the passage into Samuel, detailing like the defeat of uh, the Philistine giant uh, by David's men. Again, it's uh, this giant is unnamed, but they were usually up to ten feet tall, like three meters, and um, uh, those are mentioned in the Bible. They also had uh, fortifications and the Israelites were pretty fearful because they looked like grasshoppers compared to them. And this is pretty much the uh, same reason they wandered in the desert for uh, 40 years because they, they, you know, they were fearful when they first saw the, the, the promised land, uh, which is the Levant. And when, when they saw the, the fortifications and also the people inhabiting this area, they, they were really afraid. So they doubt, they doubted the, uh, that Yahweh, could uh, protect them and help them in their conquest. So that's why they want so all who want uh, who doubt this had to uh, you know perish in the desert, wander in the desert for forty years. So once they died, the new campaign uh, was with the people who trusted that Yahweh could give them uh, the promised land. And against those people, and we know there's there's this account called the uh, wars. Of Yahweh, so there's a book that disappeared. I don't know, maybe uh, was it like the third century or or earlier when this book disappeared? Uh, and it's named. Well, I think Raz, it's referenced by Wikipedia. Well, Roz, um, I think your point is that because uh, humans that were larger than uh, normal humans today existed, that some that they could have been manipulating and building these larger structures that. That, that you and I and Mike would have a lot of problems putting up like these dolmens and sage wall and other places, right? You're talking about the ability of larger humans or human-like species, right? Yeah. Uh, whose skeletons we have found on the planet to have been building these. And that's that's a good point. But I think we got we should probably zoom on to Puma Punku, if that's okay, and, and Tiawanaku, because sure, we, the... we, we only have another 45 minutes. Sure, but one one quick question: Do you yeah. think it would have been possible for you know ten feet tall human-like beings to uh, you know uh, construct uh, all those megalithic walls? Do you think it would have been uh, you know every possible? major culture around the world? All these um, have these older tales of giants on every continent around the world, and I find it interesting having traveled through Egypt and you look at a lot of the depictions, you know, it looks sure certainly looks like they're depicting giants on these, um, uh, um, in these, uh, scenes, um, you know, um, with a lot of normal sized people around them. Um, and, and there's so many drawings like that throughout Egypt, all over the place at multiple, multiple sites. Um, they show them carrying, um, uh, stones and all sorts of different things that dwarf in those same pictures what look like regular sized people, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, and you have carvings from, um, is it a, a folk, and Assyria as well, right? Yeah. Holding lions and stuff, and they, and they look like cats in their arms. And you know, are these just fanciful depictions of, uh, strength and power for rulers or is there these actual giants and precisely i know that typically we don't carve things into stone to um what's the word 
I don't know. I don't know. You know, that's really hard to say, but you find these things all over the world. Um, these either legends or these depictions um, that show us in scale as being much smaller as, uh, in comparison. And you have, Egypt's a perfect example. You have depictions in, um, of, uh, of these, these giants moving stones and stuff. And certainly um, in, in, in things like the Book of Enoch and stuff, you have tons of examples of, uh, and, and it, within, you know, description uh, being described, these giants being described within the Book of Enoch. Um, and, and as you said, the, the Nephilim is, you know, how they refer to them then. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there was some, if there was something that was, you know, a, a giant or something that could absolutely, you know, lift, that seems like that would make things much more possible in terms of moving some of these things. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the Book of Enoch. Roz is a big, big fan and researcher of the Book of Enoch. And, I, and uh, so you guys are definitely on the same wavelength. And I, I'm so into the giant pictures. I haven't done the research Roz has done, though. But yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Let's zoom on to Puma Punku. This is, by the way, this one's from Indonesia. This is just a, um, a massive footprint in, in, that this guy's standing next to, West Java, Indonesia. I talked to the guy who... Uh, a guy who, on Facebook who has been there. And so I have his information if anyone wants to find out where that is. Um, this is a do-it-yourself network. They're, these people are coming to their new home and someone noticed that this looks like uh, toes, giant toes that they're in between these giant toes. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna stop share. And uh, and so, yeah, let's get to Pumapunku and, and Tiwanaku. I'm super excited to see what you found up there, Mike. Yeah, um, that was an interesting adventure. Um... We went during the height of COVID. I traveled all through COVID. <laughs> it was great. We got, we'd buy the cheapest tickets and we'd get entire rows to ourselves. Wow. Nobody was flying. It was also really great to explore sites because we had these places all to ourselves. When I got to Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, it's not far from La Paz at all. We did a, you know, a couple hour drive or something, if I remember correctly up into the uh, top of the Andes there. It was great because we had the site all to ourselves. There was no one around. In fact, Puma Punka was closed. They had a, the gate shut. It was it was, it was was completely closed. Oh my God. Tiwanaku was the, the only one that was open. So we went into Tiwanaku. Yeah. We explored, we filmed there. And then I went to talk to the, the museum. They have a little museum down there with some interesting stuff. It was closed also. And so I had gone down because they had this gathering of el elders um, for the for the area because they were doing some kind of ritual ceremony or something out there. They were all in the their garbs and and the outfits these these traditional outfits out there waiting. They were practicing some ceremony, and so I was able to connect with this lady um, who was kind of overseeing the sites. And so I'm sitting there talking to her on a <laughs> this low stone wall and. The instructions to my buddies was to get the drone up over Tiwanaku to film it, but make sure to keep it high enough that you couldn't hear it. I'm talking to her and I'm trying to get permission to go into the museum and look and maybe even possibly film. Yeah. And I hear this, you know, I hear the drone and I'm like, oh no, they're they're coming way too close, right? And I, I see her kind of look, She we're facing each other and she kind of looks like, what? what is that? And they keep getting closer and she looks around again. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what my buddies were thinking, but the drone just comes flying like 30 feet, maybe 30 feet, 20 feet off the ground, right down the center strip of the town, directly overhead of us. Oh, and she looks up and she's just like, really? And she looks over at me and she's like, is that yours? And there's just no way out of it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's mine. She's like, all right, come here. We got brought into the the local office up there. I tried to work a little charm on her. Uh, she was agreeable. We agreed to share footage with them. And then they allowed us into Puma Punku. And they went over and opened the gates and let us in. Let us fly the drone over it. I have drone footage of Puma Punku <laughs> with no one, and Tiwanaku, no one around. It was wow. pretty amazing. We got some unique shots. This exact design I found in Lebanon and, and other places carved into the stones in the exact same way. We have two theories. One is the, the archaeological uh, orthodoxy telling us that these are stones that were carved by primitives. 
And then we have another theory, which is the alternative archaeologist saying that these are concrete, molded concrete. So what do you think? I think South America definitely lends more than some other places to the idea of geopolymers or poured stone, especially when you start looking at places like Machu Picchu or different places like Saxayman, where everything looks poured and molded. But then not only that, but you start taking into consideration the placement of the final structure and what it would have required to get some of this, these massive stones up on top of these mountains. I'm not really the type of person that wants to like put my foot firmly in one camp as far as, you know, whether it's Sagewall and B&G Apolymer or any of these other places around the world, because I want to leave. I don't want to get locked into one mode of thinking. I want to be open to exploring the different ideas. So even with Sagewall, like we were talking about earlier, I do want to stress that I'm not suggesting that I that I absolutely think that the sage wall is geopolymer or something like that. I've just pointed out in my videos that some of it looks very interesting and along those lines. And I want to explore those paths. And I think it's important to kind of leave that, it, especially in terms of my role being a documenter. Um, I try to present things in such a way that it leaves the viewer, that it's not influencing the viewer's opinion. Right. So I really do, when I share my thoughts on sites, try to stress that this is my opinion. And I don't want to lock the viewer into a specific mode of thinking. I my, my, my greater focus is to hopefully generate and stimulate the viewer's own thought processes in terms of coming up with their own ideas, because that's how you get new, unique ideas that contribute to the, uh, to the work and the conversation. You also, at the same time, you can't help but connect the dots or a lot, you know, a lot of these different places, right? You know, sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. There are very different, unique types of stoneworking in places like Peru and Bolivia compared to some other places around the world, even like Egypt and Baalbek, in terms of the shaping of the stone. Now, I say that, but then you also have examples of things like in Egypt, the casing stones around the pyramid, a lot of those look very rounded and poured in the way they're fit together and they have nubs on them and all sorts of stuff that look like a whole part of the process. You know, we've been trying to figure out how they stacked multi-ton blocks into a pyramid shape for a long, very long time. And if they had the understanding of concrete and concrete blocks, how much easier would it have been to create molds that they poured this concrete into, allowed it to shape and get these perfect blocked stones a pyramid would have been much easier to create if you if you understood how to pour concrete that basically solidifies into a perfect stone that would last thousands of years that seems much easier than lifting megaton blocks up to the levels that they did in egypt so i certainly am enjoying the process of documenting as much as i can so people can kind of see a wide array of stuff from around the world as i continue to kind of go from continent to continent 100 percent. well this is the top of the the great pyramid in in egypt in on the giza plateau and i just wanted to mention that people think that the all the blocks that the egyptians put up for these larger pyramids on the giza plateau are all the same shape but you can right. see these are slightly different shaped blocks and slightly different sized blocks so there's an asymmetrical construction to these blocks whether they were cut natural stone or whether they're concrete is a different issue but i just want to bring that up to people to 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 let people see that the construction is with asymmetrical blocks is an earthquake mitigation a brilliant earthquake mitigation technique yeah so hopefully you guys can see, I mean, you even have some small examples here from Leb Lebanon. This is in Fakra of little nubs and stuff, but you can see the half pattern here at the top of this structure that's comparable to this one in Tiwanaku. You know, you have little nubs and stuff down here, but up here you have, you know, kind of a half shape and this block looks incomplete, but a half shape comparable to the one found in Tiwanaku. This is in Fakra, Lebanon. I feel it's similar pattern here in Egypt and yeah. Italy. And so I, I feel it's pretty much the same pattern from, from what you uh, you showed us. It, it looks like, I don't know, the, the shape of a step pyramid or something like that. But I I can see this pattern repeats all across the world. And it's not the only one, not the last one, the last pattern to repeat like this. We, right, we can right. find a ton of similarities between uh, those cultures. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll share one more with you here and get back to the um, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. 
but this is uh, in Biblos down at the bottom in Arizona there at the top. You know, you see some of these things just really stick out to you um, as you go around the world. Well, you are a world traveler, so this is what's great about your personal journey in your life is that you've been to so many sites and you can make these connections. Yeah, they really, as you start paying attention, you know, I started understanding the importance of, you know, when I first started, I was trying to get as many videos out of each trip as I could. And now I, I extend these trips a little bit longer so I can spend longer at a site, which the rare times that somebody's traveling with me that's not interested in um, ancient sites has got to be very annoying because I can I could spend all day at a site that most people will walk through in an hour yeah but now I um I've also refined my filming process when we started we were carrying around just a whole pelican case full of gear with lavaliers and big camera and tripods and all sorts of stuff and I just yeah. you know I knew that I needed to simplify and so now I can walk a site with a day, like a day bag or a sling bag with my drone and my iPhone, a battery pack. And I film everything on my iPhone now. Wow. Um, and I do, it just brings up, but it's not, I, I do want to make a point for anybody who's out there traveling. If you're going to ancient sites, the thing, there's a trend that's starting to happen at these ancient sites around the world. They're starting to recognize the amount of people that are coming to places as YouTubers or content creators that are bringing on in full setups for filming. Right. And they don't allow it anymore. They, they don't allow it or you'll have to pay some huge um, fee or different things like that. So, for example, I've been to Chichen Itza many times. Yeah. And there was no problem. Nobody ever checked anything when I first, the first time I went there. Um, the last time that I went, that I couldn't even bring a GoPro in. Um, I They let me bring a GoPro in with no attachments. I couldn't even have a handle on it. And the microphone attachment that I had on it, I had to get rid of that. I had lavaliers. They wouldn't let me come in with that. And that, visiting that site and what they were doing there ultimately is what really, I already had thought about it, but really is what firmed me up in terms of filming with the iPhone. Because okay. they'll let you film all day with an iPhone, which now these phones are so advanced, they're they're better than my phone, my iPhone so. um, films better than the GoPros. <laughs> and you can film in yeah. low light now, which the GoPro is just horrible at, at least it has. Yeah. I haven't used it in over a year. So yeah. Um, you know, just be aware of that. If my budget now per year for camera equipment just consists of upgrading my phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> Maybe we could spend some time on Baalbek, uh, unless you want to have other yeah. from Bolivia. I have this pulled up, um, so I'll just share this with you real quick, and then I can go over to Baalbek. Sure, sure, sure. But I'll just show you guys some of the footage that I was able to take at uh, – Puma Punku by drone. I thought, oh, he probably has a little proprietary about that footage, but I, so I didn't ask you for it, but I'm so glad you're going to share it with us. My content and footage gets ripped off, so I don't even try to track it down. There's so many channels that yeah. just yeah. take my content and do yeah. talk over it and do their own thing. I, I would spend all day, every day, trying to track that stuff down if I cared, and I really don't. But if, if it's used for like a television show or something for profit, right. You do have to get permission for that. I mean, they legally have to get permission. So, 100%, 100%. But as you can see, we got the site all to ourselves and we just sat on the outside of it and ran the drone over all of this. We were able to just get right up on I mean, Yeah. This was so, we were just, I was like a kid in a candy store. I wish that at the time I was traveling um, with a guy that I had helping out with filming. And um, I didn't know the drone yet. And so when we parted ways, I took over a drone and just practiced until I learned it well enough. I wish that I had been flying it back then because I would have gotten it so just up on all, all of this, you know? I really push the limits nowadays. It was very interesting going here and then seeing the layout of everything because everything up to this point that I'd seen about P Puma Punku, it, it just, it felt very different. Um, when I got there from what I, I saw on TV up to that point. But you can see this structure of the area that's still, you know, a lot of it being excavated. You can see all around, like, there was this um, complex here. And I've seen some good recreations of what this all used to be. 
Yeah. But this is um this is also way up in the Andes. You're very high up. The air is very thin. And you know, that's the town. Okay. And off in the distance over there, those mounds, that's Tiwanaku. Okay. And so they're very close. Tiwanaku's right there. And basically where we're at, the drone is at right here, yep. right below it is the is Puma Punku. Right. Puma Punku is just a just a tad bit south of Tiwanaku. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this far. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. So you, you could walk it um, mm -hmm. in no time. Right. It takes, you know, less than a minute to drive from the entrance over here to uh, to here. Right, right, right. Uh, down this one main road. But now, uh, there's a yeah. theory that, that this, this site was uh, destroyed by an earthquake, and that sort of makes sense. What do you think that the that all these th blocks used to be sort of more set up than they are? Yeah, you know, I'm. Um, I think. Um, I think I've read that this area used to be a dock that Lake Titicaca used to extend all the way out to um, to this area. Okay. And then there was a port city. Right okay. there. Interesting. Um, I think Graham Hancock goes over that in um, some of that in his book, Fingerprints of the Gods. Yeah, Lake and... Titicaca is about 15 miles west of there because uh, that's about where the Peruvian uh, border is with Bolivia. So it, so it must have, so I guess the theory is that it was 15 miles or so further to the east. Yeah. Um... Unfortunately, and we didn't get to go to the where the places that I wanted to go to up there. So I didn't get to go to Lake Titicaca and explore some of the areas around that, right. which was, you know. But I'll tell you what, one of the places that I'm wanting to go back to the most, and most of the time, as of right now, Sagewell is the only place that I've gone back to to do more, do more work. Um, you know, I've really been focusing when I started out my kind of career in this, and the channel and everything was getting a wide variety of places which is why i've traveled so much to all these different sites and usually um, i don't pick something that i've a place to go back to but peru was um one of the first trips i went on and i absolutely did not know what i was doing i was just filming with the gopro it was the first trip that i went on and decided to try to make videos out of and um, if i can't wait to go back and give it its proper due in terms of uh documenting everything there I mean, Peru, you could just go to Cusco and just explore around Cusco for a month and be happy um, without going anywhere else in the country. That It's just amazing down there. And that extends into Bolivia. And Bolivia has so much amazing stuff to look at as well. And Bolivia has some amazing natural features that are just beyond uh, um, awesome to, to, to really explore also. You know, I did want to share this comparison photo with you guys because these are always mentioned in terms of the largest megalithic uncut stones in the world usually it's Baalbek that takes number one but Yangshan and Aswan Quarry are all in there now you can see I'm in each one of these shots here's Aswan Quarry yeah. and that's me there this is Baalbek <laughs> and then this is Yangshan and I'm right here if you can see <laughs> yeah so Baalbek is widely considered the largest stone. And as you can see, this piece here just completely shatters that narrative, in my opinion. The stones there at Yangshan are just, they're massive. And these cuts go all the way underneath. There's another one right here that's blocked by the grass, the tall grass here. But yeah. just like these two cuts, there's another, or there's a third one that goes under right here, yeah. down the length of it, right? Now, there's two other massive pieces back here behind the trees. And I do have a drone video of Yangshan Quarry there in China that yeah, shows yeah. the entire site very clearly. Um, uh, so, you know, if anybody's watching and wants to explore Yangshan, which I highly recommend because I feel like it's kind of, again, criminally overlooked um, mm -hmm. in terms of its, uh, you know, place in, in ancient history and where, you know, how it should be considered. But that stone just dwarfs both of these other, other sites. And I, you know, I don't think that the descriptions of Yangshan Quarry in terms of the largest stones, it's estimate estimation on size and weight. I, I, I can't see how that's accurate when you look at these together in comparison. So that's a lot of fun to get into. It's been uh, very exciting to have those to compare. Um, and um, each of these sites are, are very unique in their own ways because they all 
have multiple examples of stoneworking and tool marks and different things like that, some more than others. And in my opinion, I'll just let that lead us into Baalbek because in my opinion, Baalbek is just the crown gem of the ancient world in terms of what it has to offer when it comes to all these little details that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half plus. Mm -hmm. if, if, if there was somebody out there thinking about, well, I want to go to the most amazing singular site because there's a lot of places that have mo Egypt has everything all over the place. You could spend months there exploring all the different places in Egypt. But if you were picking one singular site, uh, it's just it's in terms of just being overwhelmed and odd. It's hard to it's hard to pass up Baalbek, um, in my opinion. Now, other people may have a different opinion of that. They may have been more impressed by walking up on the Great Pyramids in Egypt or maybe. Um, different sites in Peru and stuff like that. And I can totally see that. But Baalbek was just, after going to all these places, Baalbek was just absolutely incredible. You have to walk around the outside perimeter all the way to the back. And it's it, it's a good distance. It's a nice little hike. It is paved and there's a trail that leads you back there. And if you follow that, it will take you all the way around to the back. And on the inside of this is the entire area and courtyard and area. I think Temple of Jupiter is right over here. And the ground level is going to be up here somewhere in this range. Academia is telling us that these these blocks are cut stone that were dragged there or somehow moved there by primitives. Now, what about the the idea that these were cast concrete, cast in place, cast in situ? You know, we've got all of these wonderful examples that I think are more plausible for for something like that because we have the example of the stones being cut just a mile down the road at the quarry with the unfinished and unremoved cut stones there at the quarry you know to kind of dive into that topic just a little bit more i think one idea doesn't always negate another there, there's the possibility that we have these examples of all of these different types of workings around the world whether it's geopolymer it's this ability to cut and move these megalithic stones we have these different examples of working stone in such massive and impressive ways so there might have been multiple techniques using all over because you know when you look at a wall like saxe Wuman. And then you look at a wall like this, they're very different. They're both megaliths, but they, they, they're they very different um, in terms of how it looks like they were created or formed. One very rough cut, hewn out stone here, like at Baalbek. And then a wall like Saxe Wuman that looks like it's poured perfectly together and shaped in these incredible um, types of overlapping and odd structures and angles and stuff, right? Not right. square. So very different, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, if I was going to make an argument for geopolymer, I would definitely stick to South America. Is it common knowledge that successors of other civilizations found the sacred places of the ancients and built on, on top of them, just like we see here in the case of Baldwin with the Romans? Do you, do you think they built on top of a more ancient settlement? I think that's something that happened all over the world. Because you have clear, clear examples of as you move up, the abilities of the, the workers or the builders becoming less and less refined and capable. Absolutely. So the base of these structures is more advanced than the tops, the middles and tops. And sometimes you have multiple layers of, let me see if I have a better shot of this. It's very interesting considering the advancement of the Romans and all the stonework they left as legacies. I mean, there are still paved roads dating back from the time of the Romans that are still in pretty good shape. You can still ride a car on them and the use of algae in the concrete. So they made the concrete last for, for thousands of years. So it's, it's really incredible to uh, think of cultures that predated them that were at least on the same level of sophistication as they were. You know, I think a recent explanation for Roman concrete being their use of these large line chunks and deposits that would basically ask, act as band-aids or fillers. So, you know, as the road might break apart over time, cracks or things would form that would allow rainwater in that would dissolve the limestone over time. And that limestone would spread and fill those cracks, thereby making a self-healing road. And that's why those Roman roads have lasted for so long. Isn't that amazing? Well, well yeah, it's incredible. These different sized blocks. I always think of earthquake mitigation whenever I see the difference. Yeah. 
Spalbeck was just an absolute kind of candy shop for any kind of person looking for all these different examples of a lot of fun. I spent two days there. And uh, I could have spent a week. I love those. I love those roundish stones amongst the other yeah. ones. Fantastic. Yeah, right. Just fitted right in. It just had nothing better to do than be intricate and meticulous. <laughs> Whoever they were, you know, it's fantastic. Yeah. Why not? We can. Let's. So why not? Exactly. This is what I always think. You know. Uh, and that's a corner right there. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you have these symbols, which remind me very much of, uh, you know, sacred geometry type stuff. He's got those insets, which really feel like uh, concrete to me because it's so hard to just to chisel out insets like that. Those right. square insets. Beautiful stuff. I'm like a just tiny thing in the midst of all this. You know, it's pretty awesome imagine for one second what this looked like and it's finished in pristine form yeah. and the, the society and culture that inhabited it, this space yeah what that what that would do to you as a person you know it's um to to live amongst this type of stuff everything that we there is there's no style or soul put into any kind of design anymore we walk through our cities and these block towers of steel and glass that with nothing around us that's inspiring and any art piece that inhabits a corner of a city or in a park is just nonsense and mess nothing of the creative ability and styles of people from the past exists anymore is created anymore nothing that you walk on and you just, as you're passing by, stop and take a minute to just appreciate yeah. in modern art or yeah. design or architecture. Mm -hmm. So just think about the effects of that on people. Um, you know, to be inspired uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to be around this type of beauty and magnificence. We've scaled everything down in our culture and society to just practicality and usefulness and time ability to have time to construct something you know we work on such a minute scale now of turning things over so quickly that we don't create anything like this anymore well i just want to show you pictures of, from balbeck this is a screenshot from a video he talks about geopolymer as a possibility and i just i i put some text in there because i feel like because academia calls this a quarry but we have l soft layers of material in between the blocks that make it look like they're placed there as part of a structure that's that's very oddly not horizontal but uh you know several degrees away from the horizontal but it looks like construction rather than oh we're going to quarry these natural blocks in other words to me it looks like these are concrete blocks that were placed there and that that uh the archaeological orthodoxy misdiagnosed this as a quarry but it all looks constructed because we have the soft material between the harder harder blocks that would would serve as earthquake mitigation you know i can uh, i can show you up close shots of that in between section right here i oh, have it. yeah bring it See, this is what we need we need conversation and we need evidence and that's what we're doing right now so this is good and that's between those two main blocks i think if i had the ability to pour and you can this is the underside of the main the stone of the pregnant woman where it looks like they were trying to remove the that top stone. And I think a lot of these were made in the position that they were made and at angles so that once it was quarried away, they could slide it into a place and leverage it up for movement, if, if that makes sense. Whereas if it was flat, as they removed the stone underneath, it would have just fallen flat on the ground. They would have had to figure out a way to wedge it back up and then leverage it. But by creating it at the same, the whole area slopes downwards as far as the core, the core of these main pieces. And, it, you know, I guess that kind of just insinuates to me that they would have cut it free and it would have slid, slid down into a place where they could then I guess tilt it over and move it somehow. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you had the ability to 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 pour concrete at a size like this, yeah, 
why would you not do it in place at the site where it's going to go? You can see there where they're, you know, being cut away, but you can see also where I was just showing a minute ago where it's still attached. Now, this is what's great about the site is you can see all the different examples of the process. Hopefully they keep doing excavation, which nothing was happening while I was there because that, that the larger stone that's beneath the ground level there that's right. now exposed didn't used to be exposed and there's more down there right um that hasn't been exposed yet but you can see all the areas here around the stone where other things have been removed and cut out um there's marks like like this all over the ground squares and block shapes of other examples of where things were removed previously that's back at uh ball bag that's awesome man. Oh, there's that's this, huge in the background. Yeah, there's this whole it's wall of huge. massive stones before you get to the trilithons. I absolutely love this name, Wandering Wolf. And he's got the wolf print. We all need to be wandering wolves, okay? We all need to get out there on the land and share with our friends our little videos that we made, and we'll have a conversation. That's what we're here for, okay? That's 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 what humanity should be doing. That's what science is. Science is a conversation among persons with evidence. If we don't have a conversation, then science just stops in its tracks. And so let's keep asking questions. Let's keep having fun. Science is fun. In, in, in school, you sat in a classroom and you thought that that was science, but it wasn't science. That was sitting in the classroom. Science is getting in the lab. Science is going outside. and and investigating, engaging with, with your open mind. What, what a fantastic uh, adventure, right? So Mike, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing all your amazing footage and your amazing photos and your amazing experiences with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. It was an absolute pleasure. And I will say, if you guys check me out on YouTube, show me a little love on Rumble. They, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're better to their creators over there, um, noticeably. And uh, but I put both all my content up on Rumble and um, and uh, and YouTube now. It's Wandering Wolf in both places. I think I'm on. You can find me at Wandering Wolf Productions or Wandering Wolf on uh, on Rumble. And then uh, Twitter is my other big platform. So um, yeah, and the, and there's there's always a new adventure coming. I'm sitting on like four to five terabytes of filmed footage that I haven't edited yet. So there's so much still coming Ooh. from Egypt to Lebanon, to Vietnam, Cambodia and Angkor Wat, Ooh. Scotland and all sorts of different places. I'm, I'm working hard to get all that content out. And uh, I'm glad that you guys uh, have enjoyed it. And thank you so much for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure. I, I really enjoyed having all these conversations and discussing all this stuff. It was a lot of fun guys. Awesome. Well, do you have any last words of wisdom for our audience? I mean, can you sum up uh, uh, your your uh, your wisdom on the subject of ancient history for us? Keep asking questions. There's no wrong answers. I think if you keep exploring, don't be don't be afraid afraid to 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 uh, make a mistake or two along the way. That's those are guiding points to help keep us moving towards. Uh, our goals and stuff, right? Set a goal, get out there, find something you're passionate about and, and just keep going after it. Um, but ask questions. That's, that's my biggest hope in everything that I'm doing and, and all the footage that I'm sharing is that hopefully it inspires people to maybe take one trip that they didn't think they could do, or maybe go out and start hiking their areas. They're very, you know, they've been exploring for a long time, but now they start taking pictures and contributing and posting them. And maybe make some connections with other people um, and, and find yourself a community uh, of other people to bounce your ideas off of that are supportive. Yeah. I think everybody should go check out Wandering Wolf. And uh, as J.R.R. Tolkien told us, not all who wander are lost. <laughs> Let's uh, let's hope we have more great guests on here, like Mike, on, on our Archaic Knowledge podcast. Thank you for being our very first guest we are honored to have had you. Absolutely. Wishing you guys nothing but success. Thank you, sir. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Mike.